Welcome to this edition of the Scientific Audiophile, where Hemholt and I are going to talk about this, the Fosse V3, a sub $100 amplifier that promises up to 300 watts. It's got a small form factor and a decent looking case. But it's not all unicorns and roses. This is the Scientific Audiophile, so click the subscribe button and stay tuned for our review of the good, the bad, and the ugly concerning the Fosse V3. So the Fosse comes in this nice little box, nothing special. The little foam keeps it protected. And inside you get the instruction manual, which is a little bit longer than you might expect. It's in different languages, but you get the information, quick setup, and everything's quick about this. It's, you don't know how to set this up. You really don't need a, uh, an amplifier at all because you don't know what you're doing. Um, you've got the AC adapter. Now notice I got the five amp, 48 volt, not the standard 32 volt um, that you'll get for $89. We'll talk about this more a little bit later. Okay, and also what's pretty cool here is I got the uh, burnt orange, scientific audiophile orange knob that Fossey makes specially for my channel and my subscribers. As also you should be aware of, as I will tell you in all my videos, this amp was sent to me by the company. You can see it's got a nice small form factor. It's got nice little vent holes on the rear. You've got your um, input, which is all you get is the RCA inputs and you get the outputs to your speakers, which can accept bananas. The pre-out isn't really a pre-out, it's a um, line out. If you power this all the way down, hook up a subwoofer, it'll still get sound. So it's not really a pre-out, it doesn't control the volume. Um, but it's a nice little unit, look at that. The knob comes off real easy, just pull it out, put on your scientific audiophile burnt orange knob, especially made for my people, my channel, and uh, you're done. You got yourself a nice little looking amp and uh, works well. At least it's as simple as it can get. So let's take a look at this amp, the good, the bad, and the ugly. I previously posted a video that based purely on specs and capabilities, the Fosse is not the bargain king. I felt the true bargain king with the Yamaha RS202 receiver. If form factor was not important to you, the Yamaha wins hands down on feature set alone. But that wasn't a review. It was just a comparison of prices and what you got for the price. No, the Fosse V3 isn't the budget king. But is it a killer amp that should have the makers of high-end audio worried? We're going to find out. Fosse contacted me and sent me this very special edition of the V3 just to butter me up. The Scientific Audiophile Edition comes with a burnt orange colored knob to match my outfit. When I contacted Fosse, just to let them know, I didn't authorize them using my patented trademarked color they let me know that you can't patent and trademark colors. So the $5,000 I paid to Shamu down the street to file the legal paperwork seems to be for naught, and Shamu isn't answering his calls or texts anymore. Additionally, my Fosse contact said they made this decision for the burnt orange knob long before they even knew about my YouTube channel. Well, I find that hard to believe because I have over 3,000 subscribers, and my mom's telling me I'm doing great. And as we saw in the unboxing video, it comes with this nice little scientific audiophile orange knob for an extra $10. It's 100% worth that because you can remember the scientific audiophile every time you go to change the volume, which you'll be doing a lot because there's no remote control. You can go to Fosse's website and get it for the $10. There is one problem with the Fosse website, which has not been rectified as of the time of this recording, but might be rectified by the time you see it is that if you search in their website for scientific audiophile orange knob, it doesn't return anything. So you have to search for just orange. I've let my Fosse contact know about this and hopefully they'll make the change soon. Fosse shipped me the V3 with this 48 volt five amp power supply. This is not the standard 32 volts you get for $89. It costs $109 on their website. 
if you get it with this. So spend the extra $20 because there's a big wattage boost, at least according to the specs um, with this. So the good is you get a low starting price point. You get the scientific audiophile orange burnt knob, small form factor, and possibly 300 watts into a 4 ohm load with a 48 volt 10 amp power supply. Not the 5 amp I was sent. One thing I really hate, because it's not audiophile, are companies over hyping their product. You go find a 10 amp power supply on the retail market and you'll be spending $150 or more. Even if you buy the Fossey V3 with the cheapest power supply, to get everything this amp has to offer, you'll be spending $230. Worse yet, Fossey doesn't offer the 10 amp power supply on their website. I'm sorry, do not tell me a product can do something and not offer the consumer the options on, their, on your own product page to buy the things it needs to do that. Now, lots of companies love to overhype their products, using clipping levels as peak power, and that is bad. But Fossey is going into the pants on fire category with their claim of 300 watts by two with 32 volt power supply, which is listed on their Amazon page. Even on their own website, they only mention the 32 volt and 48 volt 5 amp power supplies and state 300 watts by two into four ohms. Finding the details on exactly how much this amp is rated to deliver with each respective power supply takes a lot of digging. 99% of consumers will think that if they get the 48 volt 5 amp power supply, they would be getting the most out of this amp. They claim to be from audiophiles for audiophiles on their website, but honestly, I think they should stick with what's on the box. High five made fun. According to testing done by Amir over at Audio Science Review, the standard 32 volt power supply produces just over 30 watts into an 8 ohm load and a bit over 60 watts into a 4 ohm load. The 48 volt power supply he tested boosted it significantly, getting this little guy to test over 85 watts into an 8 ohm load and 140 watts into 4. These numbers are a little bit lower than Fossey states in their literature, which is also very hard to find. Add the scientific audiophile burnt orange knob, the 48 volt power supply, and you're at $120 for this amp, not 89. Is it worth it? I started this review with a plan. Let's compare the Fosse to a top flight $3,000 integrated amp. My reference, the Yamaha AS2100. No, it doesn't have all the inputs of an integrated amp. After all, it's not an integrated amp. It doesn't have cool meters, a beautiful exterior, or even balanced inputs. But that's not what I wanted to compare. It's about how good is this little amp? If it's as good as one of the best, or at least close to as good, shouldn't those of you who don't want to spend money on aesthetics be able to buy this amp and spend even more of your budget on speakers? The old adage is to spend twice as much on your speakers as the rest of your entire system. In essence, if you have 2K to spend on a setup, most people will say spend 1K in your speakers and allocate the rest to everything else. But what if the Fosse is good enough to change the paradigm on how much an amplifier should cost? What if a $2,000 budget now spent you can now meant you could spend three or four times as much on your speakers? This isn't pie in the sky stuff. Speakers are nearly everyone's weakest point in terms of hi-fi equipment. Now, I'm not talking about room treatments, which everyone's Achilles heel, but the weakest point in everyone's system is usually their speaker. So I listened to them. 200 hours of burning, 600 hours of listening. And before I give you my subjective impressions, I did some side-by-side -side measurements when I was done with subjective listening. I didn't want to just hook the amps up to an analyzer and show the results. I wanted to play real music through real speakers and check its dynamic range throughout the song. Because most of you are not familiar with Diane Bish, I'm getting familiar with that. I'm surprised by how few of you really know that the queen is the queen and you should listen to nothing else. I decided to get a track from Jethro Tull's 2017 reissued CD of Jack and the Green from the album Songs from the Wood. Why this track? Because according to the Dynamic Range database, 
Jack in the Green has a 15 dB dynamic range. So let's say you want to listen to the quietest parts of this track at 85 dB. Can these amplifiers, the Fosse and the Yamaha 12 2100, drive my Tannoy DC-80s? My plan was simple. Level match these amps using my calibrated U-mic, then record the output from each amp and see if what comes out of the speaker is different. Now, this is not measuring frequency response or anything else. It's just measuring decibel level output. The first thing I did was I played white noise through the Yamaha AS2100 and set the volume to 90 dB at 2 meters away. Done. I then played the song and recorded the decibel meter. Armed with this data, I grabbed your Fosse V3. Would the mic measure the same information? Are exotic hi-fi amplifiers nothing but eye candy from now on? Now my tannoys are rated at around 6 ohms and 89 dB sensitive. Pretty easy to drive. I didn't move anything except the RCA cables from the Yamaha to the Fosse. So if you already bought the Fosse V3, switch to another channel, another video. Because not only has the Fosse V3 gone bad with marketing sheet over-promising power, but I think the Fosse was designed for the standard amp test at one kilohertz signal. Because when it was time to level match the Fosse to the Yamaha at the same 90 dB, Houston, we have a problem. I've got this Fosse pinned to maximum volume and it won't go past 83 dB. Yes, I know white and pink noise is more of a load than a one kilohertz signal, but this is ridiculous. I thought there was something wrong. I tried again and again, but 83 was the max. Worse yet, I couldn't do a test where the Fosse's volume was pinned to max because that would most likely reduce its dynamic range and it would suffer from higher distortion. So I had to dial the whole test back to 70 dB. This is like going to a boxing match and you find out that one of the boxers is disqualified before the fight even starts. This little Class D amp can play a single one kilohertz tone loud and get to that 80 something watts. But when you throw everything out at one time, it can't handle it. Luckily, music isn't everything all at once. So in most real world scenarios, you should be able to get this to play significantly louder. But I wasn't done. I had declared the Yamaha S202 the budget king in my previous video, but I didn't have one on hand. I did have an older Yamaha RS300 rated at only 50 watts into two channels. I had to hook up this older receiver and see how it handled white and pink noise. Could a cheap 50 watt receiver from Yamaha with phono inputs, an AM FM tuner, digital display, remote control, play as loud as I wanted the Fosse to play? Once I hooked up the Yamaha RS300, I started cranking the volume. It hit 90 dB with a little bit to spare. I actually maxed it out at 93 dB. So much for any argument that a cheap amp can't handle a lot of white and pink noise. So now I was really deflated going to this final phase of testing. Not only couldn't the Fosse get nearly as loud as I wanted it to, not at all comparable to a top flight hi-fi amp, but a cheap old Yamaha RS300 stereo receiver rated at about one third the power of the Fosse rates their amp with this five amp power supply, easily bests it in a real world scenario. And believe me, I play white and pink noise a lot, so it's real world to me. So let's pop over to the music test. So for you who love looking at simple decimal meters, enjoy the next two plus minutes as I summarize the findings. My setup was as follows. We have a Yamaha AS2100 with the Fosse V3. Hooked up to those, we have a Yamaha CD2100 SACD slash CD player. Same RCA interconnects go to the CD S2100. We have the same 14 gauge speaker cable connecting both the Fosse and the Yamaha to the speakers and we have the Tannoy DC-8. Track 27 on our CD. Play. That's 67 dB.
We're a little bit over 70 right now. Let's just, just for the point of fact. It's basically thinks it's outputting about 10 watts right now. So we're going to switch our settings to 70 dB. Um, that's pretty low. So with my uh, white noise, I unfortunately could not get them exactly level matched. The soundtrack uh, is about 0.7 dB louder than the Yamaha for the Fosse, so just keep that into your mind when you're watching these decibel meters. What's important is that most of the times when you pause it, you'll notice that there's a 0.7 dB difference, obviously, because the Fosse was set 0.7 dB louder. But more importantly is some of those peaks, you'll notice that the Yamaha has no problem getting louder than it. And it's also a little bit of give on the mic. You've got to sometimes give it like a 0.2 seconds or 0.1 seconds to see the actual difference because what's happening with the mic is that it's not reacting as quickly as the music actually is because you know it's a hundred dollar mic it's nothing uh, super 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 precise but it's gives you the basic concept of what I heard during my listening sessions the big thing is notice when it drops down into like the 70s most of the time the Yamaha will get significantly quieter be around say 76 dB instead of the Fosse, which is at 77.3. There's supposed to be a 0.7 dB difference, but now there's a dB or even more than a dB um, difference. The reason is that the Fosse um, does not have the amp quality of the Yamaha, and that's that compression you'll hear in the music that when you play it loud, quiet, you're not going to hear much of a difference, but when you play your music loud in this level, you're going to hear a difference because the Fosse um, basically compresses some of that music. Again, at background listening levels, you're not going to notice much at all, but definitely at louder listening levels, that um, deep bass um, is going to be uh, a problem for the Fosse. The highs are usually never a problem just because of the fact that um, highs are so easy to produce, but um, a little bit later in the video, we're going to do a 16 kilohertz blast into these two amps and uh, see what happens, keeping them set again at the same exact levels, with the Fosse being set 0.7 dB louder than the Yamaha AS2100. So this song is almost over, and I will stop talking right now. 16,000 hertz. So notice that on the 16,000 hertz test that the Yamaha, which is set 0.7 dB lower, got significantly louder on that initial blast of loud um, sound. Now notice the meters are going to drop like a rock now because there's like no power at a 16,000 hertz. So they're both going to drop almost to the noise floor um, because there's so little power, even though they're set for um, 70 dB, there's so little energy in a 16,000 hertz frequency. But that's not the point. The point was how loud it got. Now my next test was to play 14 seconds of the introduction of Led Zeppelin's Good Time, Bad Times. In my subjective test, I felt the Fosse couldn't settle down when it got quiet right after it was very loud. Loud music sounded compressed. Here's what the measurements said. So we played Good Times, Bad Times, and what you'll notice is that the Fosse, even though it's set louder, um, during those transient responses, it's not as fast at getting quieter when the sound gets quieter. Um, and peaks also, the Yamaha seems to outpeak it at times as well, which is pretty surprising. Lastly, it was time for a noise sweep via Roo. This is directly from the computer to a topping DX3 Plus DAC, to the Yamaha AS2100, and then to the Fosse V3. 
Most minor discrepancies are purely due to the mic and testing equipment. You're going to get these types of differences no matter what. But notice the 500 to 700 hertz range. Difference around 500 to 700 hertz, even a little bit higher. The predicted um, response in that range, and not all these overlays stay the same, um, but the predicted SPL drops so significantly in the Fosse area in this range than it does with the Yamaha, which stays significantly flatter throughout that. Um, what's also interesting is this dip around 200 to 300 hertz. Now, if this was just one test, it wouldn't be a big deal. But we're going to switch from this 80 dB uh, Rue test. We're going to go to 85. Okay, so once again, we see the Fosse, which is in blue, um, significantly dipping right around 400 hertz all the way to a kilohertz um, throughout the test. So it's another problem in another test. So it shows that it's not a one-off, it wasn't just the mic settings. But let's go to 85 dB, a 90. Let's go to 90 dB. Okay, at 90, when we do the overlay, once again, same problem. And pretty much the rest is, you know, close. I wouldn't say there's anything really different here. There's following each other along. But there's always this noticeable difference between 500, even 400, to a kilohertz. But lastly, when you really crank these up. Now, again, I said before, the root couldn't get, I mean, I said before that the Fosse couldn't get to even 83 dB, even 80 dB in my white noise. But this is a root test. It's just one frequency getting slid all the way across. So the Fosse can hit these higher levels when you're just playing one frequency um, one at a time. So let's check out what happens at a lot, lot high, higher. Okay, you notice the Yamaha is getting an SPL in the 110 dB range. We put this around 105 was our setting. Um, now, that's going to push it for the Fosse, um, but this is just one frequency at a time. But notice this big dip that they've all seen throughout all the tests, um, mostly a room response slash speaker response in the 70 dB range. The Fosse was always the same in this area as the Yamaha, and then of course dipped significantly more in the 400 to kilohertz range. That's what happens when we get to the Fosse. Oh, something really ugly just happened here. And when we do the overlays, you can see it. The Fosse just breaks apart with the amount of power that's required at that kind of level um, with low frequencies, because low frequencies use a ton more power. Um, and then it can handle it. So I'm sorry, I do not believe this Fosse is rated at 80 watts um, into 8 ohms with the 5 amp power supply. Yes, at 1 kilohertz. Yes. But come on, a real amp should be able to handle this um, with a plum. And you can see the Yamaha cat. So that's the uh, measurements. And there is a difference between the two. Subjectively, at low volume, the Fosse is fine. I couldn't hear much of a difference between playing background music between it and my Yamaha AS2100. But if you want to start cranking it up for a song you really like, this isn't your amp. I'd argue it's not even a good one considering you can get a lot of cheap receivers for what this will cost you. They will have a ton more inputs, a remote, and probably have a better power supply or amp as well. It's not all bad though, if you absolutely require a small form factor. And this is a small form factor, especially for your desk, you want to sit close to your speaker, say within a meter. Don't plan on playing your music at ear damaging level at that distance. The Fosse does the job. It's a decent amp when compared to other amplifiers in its price range and form factor. But it's not changing the audio paradigm. My wine rating can only be one thing. You probably already guessed it, but a cheap bottle of sparkling white from California. Thank you for watching this edition of the Scientific Audio File. Subscribe so you'll be notified of new reviews and reactions when they are released. 
Have a great day.